with you on his mind, he is risen. The call to worship, please. The risen Christ meets us at the tomb and turns our tears to joy for your love and goodness. Christ comes through our locked doors and turns our fear to courage for your love and goodness. Christ comes to daily life and work and turns our failure to new vision from your love and goodness. Christ breaks the bread and turns our despair to hope for your love and goodness. Welcome to Knox this Easter morning. As we rejoice in the gift of Christ's risen presence with us, we sing, Worthy is the Lamb. A little extra prayer for technology, I, guess, I think, this morning. <laughs> Not quite sure that went the way it was supposed to. Um, we have a Lenten reading this morning. Nope, not the drama. It's known as the PWSD opening prayer. There we go. It just takes a little moment. There we go. And I don't see anyone coming up to read it, so I guess it's me. <laughs> God's Son was given so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. We celebrate Christ's victory and the power of God's love to transform all things. Hallelujah. Jesus has conquered death and is risen. Christ is risen indeed. The old life is gone. And the new life has come. Let us pray together. Loving God, life is stronger than death. Love is stronger than hate. And forgiveness stronger than bitterness. We are an Easter people, redeemed by the gift of God's love through Jesus Christ. We are an Easter people, filled with joy and peace in knowing our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are an Easter people, filled with hope. Amen and amen. Thank you. Let us uh, stand and sing, Christ the Lord is risen today. Just a reminder that we're not passing collecting collection plates, that there are baskets at the front if you wish to, to contribute. Um, let's take a moment now and just gather in prayer. Um, I'm going to start with some silence, and during that silence, I'd like you to just think about why you're here today. What are you celebrating? And that, uh, wh what do you hope from today's service? Lord, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for celebrating your resurrection, coming back to life to save us from our sins. Words and actions that are so natural to us that we don't even think about whether they're right or wrong. You love us so much that you have taught us, that you have shown us the way and provided the cleansing required to be with you forever. We thank you that we can gather together this day to learn from one another, to support one another, to love one another. And 
that we can be your Easter people outside these doors, outside our house door. And we thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us so that we may return them to you and honor you as you choose to spend these funds, as you choose to use our resources, our, our health and our abilities, for they come from you. Thank you that we are yours today. In your loving and beloved name, Lord Jesus. Amen. This morning comes from Matthew 20. As we continue looking at the parables during our Lenten season, it's the parable of the workers And it starts off with a very important statement. The kingdom of heaven is like. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He, that is the landowner, went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So in those who... Uh, those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day? But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do with what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The word of the Lord. We'll gain a perspective on this parable from our skit with Kathy and Jessica. I am so steamed. Why? Irene, our choir director, she gave out appreciation gifts tonight. Why would that upset you? I would think that would make you happy. Ordinarily it would, but she gave us all the same gift. What's wrong with that? It's not fair. That's what's wrong with it. I don't understand. How is this unfair? How obtuse can you be, Jessica? Isn't it obvious? It's just so unfair. No, not to me. What am I missing? Do you think you should receive something special? As a matter of fact, yes. After all, I've sung in the choir for 10 years, and I never miss a rehearsal. You don't? 
What about that time you stayed home to watch an episode of Downton Abbey? <laughs> or when you went on a shopping trip to the outlet mall? Oh, quiet. Whose side are you on? Besides, that was only a couple of times. I'm usually there, and I'm always on time, too. Always on time. How about... Okay, usually on time. I can't help it if I have to work late sometimes. The point is, I've been exceptionally faithful for 10 years, and I get the same award as people who just joined the choir, or of those who regularly miss practices or come late. I think I deserve a special award. It's not fair that I should receive the same one as everyone else. Sounds like Sunday school to me. What do you mean? You remind me of my Sunday school awards for perfect attendance. That reminds me of something else that bugs me. They don't do that anymore. They don't? No. Instead of giving out awards for the perfect attendance in Sunday school, our education committee gives out certificates to anyone who attends our Sunday school, even just once. Really? That's interesting. I guess there just aren't any standards anymore. That's what I think. Even the church isn't fair. But Kathy, I thought you were in the choir because you love to sing. Yes, so? Well, you've often talked about how you think you have a gift for singing and you want to share your ability. That's true. And you also talk about how much joy you find in the group bonding you've experienced with the choir. That's true too. Your point? Isn't the joy you have in singing and being part of the choir reward enough? I guess so. I surely don't want to give up my singing in the choir. It still doesn't seem fair though. Maybe it's not about being fair. Maybe Irene is just trying to express her joy over people singing in the choir, whatever their length or level of participation. What about Mary? What about her? Didn't she just join the choir? Yes. Didn't you tell me how happy she is to be in the choir, how she's been away from the church for a long time, but has never known a church or choir where she's felt so welcome and accepted? That's all true, and we are all very happy that Mary is part of the choir now. So maybe Irene gave everyone the same gift because she's just as happy about Mary's newfound joy in being part of the choir as she is about your long and faithful service in the choir. So Irene doesn't need to be fair when she's trying to express appreciation for each one of us? Yes, that's right. That reminds me of one of Jesus' parables. Which one? The one where the owner of a vineyard hires workers first thing in the morning and promises to pay them the fair daily wage. He goes back and hires more workers during the day, including at the last hour of the workday. When the day is over, he pays those working the shortest time first and gives them the whole daily wage. When those who worked all day come to get paid, they expect a larger amount, but the owner gives them the same wage. They complain bitterly that they were treated unfairly. Doesn't the owner say that he was being fair because he gave them what he promised? And besides, can't he do what he wants with his own money? Yes, that's right. That parable has always confused me. If the owner of the vineyard is supposed to be God, I don't think God is fair. Oh, well, that's the point. By our standards, God doesn't always seem fair. But isn't God perfect? If so, shouldn't God be fair? God is perfectly loving and perfectly just. God is perfectly fair by God's standard of fairness. I'm not sure I like God's standards. Well, this parable shows that to God, grace and acceptance are more important than what seems fair to us. God rejoices and whoever responds to God's love and faith whenever that occurs. God is just as happy to rejoice in sinners repenting, whether that happens now or 50 years ago. As the Bible says, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Never mind the choir. Don't I deserve special recognition because I've been a faithful Christian all my life? Well, that depends by what you mean by special. Isn't knowing that you can count on God's love for you pretty special? Yes, but why be a faithful Christian for so long if God gives love even if we believe a short time? I suppose you have a point, but why wait to be faithful and miss out on all the joy in life that comes from a faithful relationship with God and other Christians? Joy. Isn't working in the vineyard and in the church hard work? Sure, but working hard and knowing joy and God's presence go together. Perhaps, 
But there are times when I resent how everyone fawns over these new members who joined us as if they were God's gifts. Maybe that's exactly what they are, God's gifts to us. You and Jesus, you always have an answer to my complaint. So you're saying that God doesn't always seek fairness, but God does seek to show joy over sinners whenever they repent. So who is the last who shall be first? And whom do I need to welcome, no matter how recently they have come to faith? Yes, those are the questions. Who is the last who shall be first? And whom do I need to welcome, no matter how recently they have come to faith? Well, thank you. Being Easter people, it changes us. The resurrection changes us. Have you ever experienced, uh, as Kathy did in the skit, that sometimes life is unfair? I mean, uh, we all have. Where we get to this place of complaining, the struggle is real, isn't it? Life sometimes can be unfair. Uh, Jesus doesn't sit down with his disciples after he shares this parable and, and provide meaning for it. And, and so there are many interpretations for this. I want to look at it in light of being Easter people, and that may take us in some different directions. And so we might ask ourselves today, how does this parable relate to us being people of the resurrection? We might consider where we are as Easter people. Are, are, are we enjoying the vineyard? That's the church. That's the place that we've been put in. Are, are we enjoying the work? Or are we happy that we are getting this wage of eternal life? Or are we slacking off a little with our faith? It's a good time to ponder this on Resurrection Sunday. We cannot come to the side of the tomb and say, hmm, nothing spectacular happened here. Nothing's changed in the world. That just doesn't happen. If, if we come to an empty tomb and we later see Jesus standing before us, our lives are radically changed. Anytime we approach scripture, we might want to ask questions to help us understand a little better. Questions like who, what, when, where, why. And so I've been pondering the why this past week. For instance, why were people waiting in the marketplace to be hired? You know, they're just kind of hanging there. They're not self-employed. They don't have other employment. They depend on being hired one day at a time to get the wage they need for that day to buy food, keep shelter, have clothing. And so they're standing there. Perhaps some of those who were hired later in the day, like the 9 o'clock and the noon and the 3 o'clock, while they didn't look strong enough so they didn't get hired right away, maybe they didn't actually show up until 3 or 5 o'clock in the morning because, well, you know, they had other stuff to do, places to go, fun things to see. And maybe they showed up about 5 o'clock, you know, just the last couple of hours of work to make it look good. Like, yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm looking for a job. Ah, oh, shucks, too bad nobody's hiring me in the last hour. It's hard to say. Well, I also wondered, why did the landowner come and hire people for his vineyard? But doesn't he have regular workers? Well, Henry and I went on a wine tour not too long ago. And you see many people working. They're the regular hirees. But particularly on our wine tour, they explained to us about ice wine. You see, ice wine has to be picked at the perfect time of harvest. January, February, when it's the hardest freeze. Anywhere from minus 8 to minus 15. But not only can it, does it need to be harvested during that time, it also has to be pressed frozen or else it changes the flavor. And so when those temperatures are just right, 
The vine dresser calls everyone he knows and goes, today's the day, I need you to work, or else the harvest won't get done. Perhaps that's the case in this particular story. The timing of the harvest was ripe and it needed to be done, and so he goes out looking for workers. So why does he go out looking five times? Early in the morning, at nine o'clock, at noon, at three, at five? Well, clearly he's walking around going, hmm, I don't think we're going to make the deadline. Hmm, look at this, I hired a whole bunch, we're still not getting there. Things clearly aren't running on schedule the way it used to be. I don't know, let's say you get hired and someone says, well, I'll give you this much for a day's work. And so you're working and, you, you know, it doesn't matter how hard you work because you know how much you're going to get at the end of the day. So you take a few coffee breaks and water breaks. You hang out by the water cooler and you talk to your friends. You know, life is good. And it's like, oops, wow, well, that break then. It's supposed to be 15 minutes, about a half an hour now. It's hard to say. When I was a teenager, I was hired by a local vegetable grower, and no, it wasn't my dad. He made me work for free. This guy actually paid me. And, and initially, he hired me on an hourly wage or a day's wage. And so, you know, picking beans, I could pick four 11-quart baskets an hour. That's pretty good money when you're, when you're a young kid. And, you know, but then there were days where I just didn't feel as excited about work, and so I would pick two 11 quarts an hour. And, you know, the, the grower wasn't so angry at me as he was upset by the fact that at the end of the day, there were beans on the plant that weren't picked that would get too big or start rotting or molding or whatever. Well... He clued in, and so it became piecework per basket. All of a sudden, I was picking five baskets an hour, which was good money in the day. And you know, it made me happy because I could see that the harvest was done at the end of the day. I wonder sometimes, as resurrected Christians, we don't get a little lethargic. You know that time when you first meet Jesus? like really meet him, and you realize, I have no more shame to carry. I have no more guilt to carry. I, my anxiety, I can bring it to him, and he lifts it. I can come to him and ask for healing, and I can trust him. And there comes this joy, and you can't help but go up to other people and go, wow. I mean, I know I've been putting this off for a long time, but I just met Jesus, and guess what? He actually makes a difference. I feel so good. I have such joy. I'm sharing with the world. It's wonderful. And when we meet Jesus, we get this guaranteed wage, so to speak. Eternal life. And it's exciting, and we live for it, and, and we work for it. But sometimes, maybe with that guaranteed wage, we get a little lazy. Ah, I believe in Jesus. I think God's a great guy. I'm going to heaven. And then we sit by the water cooler. And we have a chat and we talk about all the good things about God. Or maybe we're like, well, you know, like I, I, I love God and I love going to church, but, you know, I got stuff to do. Maybe I'll show up, you know, next week or the week after or a month after. Yeah, I, I can relate to being a little lazy. Now, I don't particularly like housework. Not really at all. But you know, when you're, when you're sitting in your house and you know, you got dog hair because we have a dog and you know, now it's summer and we, we don't take our shoes off as much and the wind's blowing the dust you know, around and there's a dust everywhere and you feel kind of yucky, right? When your house is dirty. And, but then you feel so good when you get up and you clean it. The other day I was sitting and, and working on my message and stuff, and then I looked up and I said, ugh, I really should just get up and vacuum. And Hannah is home right now, and Hannah said, Mom, why don't you get one of those iRobot vacuums? Okay, in 10 seconds I Googled that thing, I put it on my Christmas list. 
what a blast. All the work gets done. I don't even have to give up. I get up. I, do, I can just sit there until you hear the little ping timer or however they work, and, and it bops around and cleans everything. And then, but of course, you know what? It never really does. And I don't know how well it gets up from carpet. And it, it, I know it definitely doesn't do stairs. And I, I've shared with you before, I have a two-story, four-level side split with an addition. This is not going to work. Where might we, as Christians, have bought into this iRobot concept? Taking the easy way out. Oh, God, God will work it out. He's, he's promised this wage. He's going to redeem the world. He's, he's going to take care of everything. And you know what? We're, we're going to get our wage at the end of the day. We, Christ says, if you believe in me, you get eternal life. Okay. It's good. As resurrected people, we might want to reflect on just what that means this morning. When, when we hear the call as resurrected people, come, work in my vineyard, find your purpose, find your meaning, receive the wage of fairness for all people, the blood of Jesus Christ that brings eternal life. It transforms us radically. And share that wage with whoever you meet. Well, another why question that we might apply to ourselves. We might want to ponder this morning on the Resurrection Sunday why so many churches are emptying, why Christian faith is dwindling, why gathering together as God's people isn't a priority for us anymore. Why do we feel empty and lost without purpose? Why are we so busy that we never take time to think about what it means to be resurrected people? Why are we too busy to work in the vineyard? And why did the hirees, the first ones, start to complain? You see, at the, at the end of the day, the landowner does a very interesting thing. He hires a bunch of people, and they work one hour, and then he goes to his manager at the end of the day, and he goes, tell you what, pay the guys who came last, pay them first. And it's not that, that God representing the landowner here is trying to be sneaky, but he's, the parable's trying to show something. And so the manager does. He, he calls in the people who worked just for the last hour, and he gives them a full day's wage. And, and what did the people who were hired at 6 o'clock in the morning say? Well, I can't wait. Like, I mean, you know, we're going to get what we deserve. We've been here all day. And they come up after watching everyone else get their pay, and they're thinking it's going to be double or triple because, you know, they've been there all day. And what do they get? The same thing. And what's their complaint in verse 12? You made them equal to us? Like, we're worth more. We've done more. We're way better. What the heck? This isn't fair. Now, equality and equity is a good thing. That's not what we're talking about this morning. We can talk about the fairness of economics, the fairness of wage. If, you, you know, if you're doing a certain job, a, a worker deserves his his wages. We're talking here this morning about the economy of the kingdom of God. You see, in God's economy, all created people are equal, are worthy. They're worthy of dignity and respect. They are worthy of, of being imaged in the glory of God. And you know what? He owes you, he owes me nothing. doesn't always feel very comfortable. God, I've been good. I worked hard my whole Christian life. I did this, I did that, I didn't do that, and I certainly didn't do that, but look at those people. Look what they did. Look what they're not doing. I, I'm a good person. I've done everything right. And God says, okay, what do you think you deserve? 
See, many are those who come seeking God, seeking spirituality, seeking religion. They're seeking a God who's fair. And then they meet, they meet Jesus. And they don't like him. How come they get the same thing I do? I'm, I'm way better than that person. They look for a God who pays each person what they deserve. You did that, well, you are going to get what you deserve. And God says, you don't deserve anything. Those who find and follow the resurrected Jesus Christ who are the ones who are seeking a gracious and merciful God because they're the ones that have come to the cross on their knees on Good Friday and went, should have been me. That's, that's what I deserve, that execution, that judgment. You see, and then we have this merciful God who doesn't dole out what people deserve because we'd have to really think about what is it do I deserve? We've been given the free gift of eternal life where Romans 6 clearly says the wage of sin is death. Did we get what we deserve? No. We've been given grace. We've been given mercy. We've been given far more than we could ever ask or imagine. And that frees us up to live and work in God's vineyard with energy. Putting aside laziness and go, man, God changed my life on that resurrection day. I didn't get what I deserved. I got way more. And you know what? So did you. And so did you. Even if you came in the last hour, doesn't matter. You're the last. Go, go in front of me, my friend. Serving others is such a gift. Being people of the resurrected Christ is to actively live out the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And as the skit says, serving with our gifts just brings incredible joy because we're equal among each other, both broken, all falling, fallen short of the glory of God and all given this incredible gift of mercy that we don't deserve. And so we can push back on this Resurrection Sunday, all our complaints, all our unfairness, all our laziness. Easter changes us. Why? Because the resurrection has changed us. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what love you have for us. We, we could hardly imagine on Good Friday that a thief could sneak into paradise with his last breath, and yet you said he would be with you. And this morning, it hits us that we barely deserve such grace either. We thank you that you love us so much, that you don't seek vengeance on us, payback. You don't throw at us what we deserve. Rather, you just throw more love, more grace, your own son. We are humbled. And we can't do anything but respond with love back, with gratitude and with joy. Thank you. O oh, risen Christ, for all that you have done. We pray, Father, that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit, that we may be filled as Easter people to tend your vineyard, to take care of the harvest that is waiting. Forgive us when we have so selfishly decided that, well, we'll get to heaven. We don't need to worry about anything else. We're sorry, Lord, that we think it was all about us. 
And so we renew our hearts and our determination this morning to serve you and be faithful workers, to bring in the harvest, and to do so using our gifts and to offer them with joy. And to, Lord, not count up all the pennies we think we deserve. We do, we do all of these things out of gratitude for what you have given us. As Easter people, Lord, we believe in the power of all that you have done and accomplished. That when you said we can be reconciled to those that we have strife with, that that can indeed happen. And so we pray for relationships, whether it's at work, with our friends, our spouses, our children. We pray, Lord, that we may be forgiving and forgive. We pray that our relationships may strengthen, and those even in our neighborhood, our community, we pray for strong partnerships, strong relationships. We pray, Father, because of your resurrection, we pray for healing. Knowing that you have conquered sin and death and sickness, knowing that we can come to you and you are a God who can do so much. We thank you for all the healing that has taken place. We thank you for keeping us safe. And we pray for those, Father, who need a touch today. We pray for Deb. We pray for those who continue with daily aches and pains. We pray for those undergoing tests and some of the concern that, that comes with it. We pray healing for those who wrestle with chronic illness and deterioration. We ask for miracles. And Father, in this broken world, we, we recognize that for whatever reason, that doesn't always happen, and yet we still pray in trust that you are our God and you have promised to never leave or forsake. And so we ask that you would be very near to those who need your presence. Be with those who continue to grieve the loss of loved ones, whether it happened yesterday or a month ago or many years ago. We thank you for the gift of other people that have been a part of our lives and the gift that they have given us, teaching us how to love and how to love even in loss. And also teaching us that with you we have strength to carry on. Lord, we pray for your resurrection power over this world. We think of Africa that's undergoing drought and, and people can't even work to get a fair wage to put food on their table. Because there is no food. There are no crops that are growing. Father, we pray for those that can't work because they're being invaded they're, or there's ethnic cleansing or there are politicians that are controlling in different ways. All around the world, there is so much injustice and so many people who don't have proper housing or food, who live in fear. God, we pray for your resurrected power to minister to the many refugees and those who are hungry. And so we thank you for opportunities that we have, for an opportunity like this morning to pray in the power of Jesus' name for them. We praise you for the opportunity when we look at all the wealth that we have and the ability that we can give to, to organizations like the Canadian Food Grains Bank, like Presbyterian World Service and Development and Presbyterian Sharing. We're so grateful, oh God, for the missionaries that we send out, for the alliances that they form with other ministries that people are being fed and sheltered. Would you multiply that work, oh God, so that people may receive that cup of cold water in the name of the resurrected Jesus and that they may have hope for tomorrow. We pray too, Father, that, that we may live daily as resurrected people, 
that our heart would yearn and prioritize the harvest. And that we would so love our neighbor as ourselves, as, as you have sh modeled for us so perfectly. You who was friend to sinners and, and laid out the table for the worst of society and sat with them and said, you are as worthy as all the ones who are in my church. We thank you for that incredible grace. We, we thank you for this day where the Son, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, shines in all his glory, seated at the right hand of God, the risen Christ. It is in his name we pray. Amen. On the PowerPoint will be a uh, responsive form of confession. I believe in the resurrection. If you could respond in the yellow, you'll begin. I believe in the resurrection. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, his hands and feet held to the wood by metal spikes. I believe that his body was pierced by the soldier's spear and even the sun was darkened as all creation grieved the death of God's eternal son. I believe in the resurrection. I believe that Jesus' body was placed in a borrowed tomb where it lay for three days. I believe that the power of God and his heavenly father brought life to his dead body and rolled the stone away from the entrance so all might see that Jesus was no longer there. I believe in the resurrection, that the unbelievable story of the women was true, just as the angel had announced. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. I believe that there is no force in the universe that could stop hinder, contain, or successfully oppose the risen Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. No nails are long enough to hold him to a cross unless he wills it to be so. No tomb can be sealed so tightly by Pilate or Herod or Caesar himself. Were there an army of a thousand men guarding the tomb, it would make no difference. Jesus said he would lay down his life and take it up again. And he did. I believe that Jesus appeared to the 11 discouraged, defeated, demoralized disciples in a room where the doors were locked and all hope was lost. I believe that when he showed them his nail-pierced hands and his spear-pierced side, they fell at his feet and cried, My Lord and my God. I believe that in the days that followed, hundreds saw him alive. All their doubt was removed, their fear gone. What could the world do to them? Jesus was alive. I believe that Jesus lives today as powerfully and perfectly alive as he was 2,000 years ago. And for all time past and yet to come, I believe he empowers his followers to follow in his footsteps, fight the forces of evil, and find their peace and joy and eternal hope in him. I believe that Jesus calls all young and old of different times, cultures, and abilities to join him in the changing world, one heart and life at a time, starting with their own. One day soon he will come again on the clouds of heaven with an army of celestial warriors whose numbers are beyond counting and whose power is beyond imagining. Then Jesus will establish his kingdom where there will be no more soldiers or spears or sepulchers or battles or bleeding wounds or crosses. I believe all of this because I believe in the resurrection. Let's respond in singing our final song. Resurrected Easter people.
May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us that which is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen.